please be advised, this episode is a conversation about sex trafficking, sexual violence, torture, and military rape, which may be triggering for some audience members. Listener discretion is advised. Are you working in a nonprofit, but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world, but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Sylvia U. Friedman. She is an award-winning filmmaker, investigative journalist, serial entrepreneur, and advisor to philanthropists. Through Sylvia's work, she has had rare and incredible access to victims of sex trafficking and modern slavery in China, Thailand, Cambodia, North Korea, South Korea, Myanmar, and Indonesia. Her latest book, A Long Road to Justice, Stories from the Front Lines in Asia, describes her personal journey in the fight against slavery. Sylvia, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for um, hosting this kind of show. It's so very needed. Well, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. This is a lot of my research background. And so I'm, I'm so glad that um, you're, you wrote this book, first off, <laughs> but that you're, you're here to really bring more of an awareness, but to, to provide a bit of a context and clarity to audience members that have heard these terms, but really don't understand. Can you specifically explain what modern slavery is, what human trafficking is, and what areas encompass human trafficking, like, like sex trafficking? Sure. Um, so generally, modern slavery is a loss of freedom. When uh, a person uh, cannot leave an exploitation type of um, job or, uh, you know, when when they've had their passport taken away from them. Um, So generally speaking, uh, it's when anyone has power over another person and forces that person to do labor or is sexually exploited uh, against their will. And uh, the term human trafficking is uh, under the rubric of modern slavery, except human trafficking has, um, you know, a tinge of, uh, you know, moving the movement of a person from one city or one country to another. Uh, But really, human trafficking is modern slavery. Um, So that's that would be my definition. Thank you. I read your first glimmer of human rights activism was sparked from hearing Kim Hak Soon, the first Korean survivor to speak to international media about her survival of Japanese military sex slavery. Can you talk about your call to this area and the work you did uncovering wartime sex slavery and sexual violence by the Japanese military from the early 1930s until the end of World War II? Yes, no, great, great question. Um, So it, uh, my journey began uh, when I was uh, turning 16. And I was uh, in Vancouver, Canada, or to be more precise, in Burnaby, uh, British Columbia, it's a suburb of Vancouver. And, um, and at that age, I had um, experienced by that time, Uh, racial discrimination, you know, in my elementary school, because I was the only Asian kid uh, in an all Caucasian uh, neighborhood and and in the class. And um, so I had uh, experienced the stinging humiliation of being, um, you know, picked on and bullied just because of the different way I looked and my cultural identity. Um, So really, I think that was the gateway to me uh, having a passion uh, for social justice. And uh, and because of that experience, it sensitized me um, to the story of Kim Hak Soon. You know, when my mother told me about this uh, elderly grandmother, I mean, she was she didn't have children of her own or grandchildren, but she was, um, you know, at that age, she was 60 something. 
And my mother explained that she was one of the the hundreds of thousands of Korean women uh, who were forced uh, or tricked, deceived into a system of military sex slavery by the Japanese government and military before and during World War II. And um, and this, you know, hearing hearing that this woman was tricked and deceived and forced into uh, prostitution at around 16, uh, that really, um, yeah, touched me on a profound level that I was surprised by. And partly because uh, when I looked into um, the books on World War II in my school library, there was no mention. Yeah, it was just a real shock to me. And I didn't understand that my textbooks were Eurocentric. And um, so, yeah, with this erasure, like it, it, it was so chilling. And then I never forgot it. And I remember at that time, I wanted to do something. I wanted to fight for these women. Uh, because the reason why Kim Hak Soon was in the newspaper was she was the first comfort woman victim or survivor. Uh, and comfort woman is a euphemism because these girls and women, and there were between 200,000 to 400,000 of them, uh, were forced to, quote unquote, comfort the Japanese soldiers on the front lines of war. And she she went against the grain of culture. And so she was kind of like, you could say, the first Me Too survivor to testify. And, um, and she did that because the Japanese government was denying and saying that they never forced any woman into forced prostitution during the war. And she was so upset and so angry that she stood up and she bore witness to what had happened to her. Um, so I felt that personal connection because I felt very strongly that, wow, you know, what if I had been born in that time in her household? It could have been me. And, um, and so I'm, I'm grateful I had that insight. And, and perhaps if I didn't have my own experience of, of racial discrimination and hardship as a child, I may not have been uh, open and sensitized to the suffering of Kim Hak Soon. And later, you know, when I researched and I met uh, Kim Soon Dok, the first survivor I met in person in Washington, D.C., um, which changed my life because after meeting her, I felt compelled to document and write these stories down. There's not enough stories of survivors out there at all. And uh, even back then, there were no books in English. I think there were like a handful of books in Korean and in other languages uh, on Japanese military sex slavery, but um, I, there was nothing at that time. And uh, yeah, that, so that's, that's what compelled me to be a voice for these voiceless ones. Mm, that's fantastic. And, and there's another area that you go into that I think, I mean, again, there's not enough stories about survivors, um, yeah. but you go into another area that I think is not often talked about. And, and you go f from the angle of the organization Door of Hope and their rehabilitative and alternative vocational options for traffickers, pimps, and others who make a living from selling girls. So Amy from Door of Hope even talks about in this book that seeing the traffickers as also being victims as they're also trapped. And you discuss two stories um, in particular that I'm thinking of, and I, I think it's pronounced Guo as an example of how people can... Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did. Hey, look at that. <laughs> well, you in Asia, right, Tiffany? You're, yes. you're like a seasoned world traveler. Yes. So it's not <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> so he, how, um, he was an example of how people can go into this life and what it's like. And even you describe um, Mary, a former mama son, how she got into this life. Because I, I think that a lot of the times when we're talking around about this, it's hard for women to wrap their head around well, why would women do this to other women too? So can you talk a little bit about um, the other end of this and you know the stories, maybe one of these, um, just explaining how people get into this trafficking and selling of girls? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'll try to unpack it because um, you've hit on a very uh, important theme that's dear to my heart. And uh, it's, it's the perpetrators. And they need redemption, too. And they're broken, too. And um, so there, there are a myriad uh, different ways uh, of how uh, victims become victimized and forced into modern slavery or forced labor or sexual exploitation. Um, one avenue is um, the Romeo trafficker, the, the man who is part of a gang or is an opportunistic, you know, mom and pop business operation, uh, if you will. And he will prey on a vulnerable girl, pretend to be her um, you know, Romeo or her lover and, uh, slowly groom her and, and slowly trick her into, um, working, uh, in, in prostitution. And, um, so I've heard cases where the Romeo trafficker will say, Oh, I'm, I'm in so much trouble. There's this gang. They're going to kill me if I don't pay back this debt. And then the girl will say, well, I, I love you and I, you know, I'll do anything for you. And he'll say, yeah, well, after we could get married, but this is, you know, this is what's blocking, you know, us from getting together. And then, she, you know, she'll say, well, just tell me. And then he will say, well, I know, I know something you could sell your body. Right. And, and help me pay off this debt. And, um, and, you know, there are a lot of naive girls out there you know, who are broken because they may have um, dysfunctional homes or, or whatever it is. And so some, some of the women do end up selling themselves against their will uh, because there is this swindler, a, a trafficker who will groom them and uh, force them into it in this manner. Other girls are sexually abused and they have no worth. And then they end up meeting um, some unsavory characters who entice them into it because these unsavory characters will get a kickback or a commission out of uh, recruiting uh, vulnerable girls. And uh, another way is migrants, migrants who want, who are, are from impoverished areas who are dreaming of a better life. And um, so they will end up flying to another country uh, but before they do, or it could be when they arrive, uh, there are, um, you know, brokers who are exploiting them and charging them this huge debt. So it's like a debt bondage. And um, so the, the migration part makes them particularly vulnerable to being exploited because then, you know, they have to pay off this huge debt and then they end up in a country where they don't have a support system. And they don't know where to get help. And then the, the, the people who are doing the exploiting, they could be lying to them and saying, well, you know, I know the law enforcement here. No one's going to believe you. Um, you know, so there, there are all these reasons uh, why people get into it. Especially when you don't speak the language and if you're in another country you know, or you're signing legal documents, not in your language. Absolutely. And that is so common, especially for domestic workers. Um, you've hit it on, on the head, the nail on the head. And another way is um, for, I'd say, almost all of the, the traffickers, the incentive is greed. It's, it's mammon. It's, it's the love of money. They want to make money. And, um, and so that, that is a powerful and really tragic motivator for uh, people who take advantage of others and en enslave them. Um, so yeah, and then in China, it, the bride trafficking that happens there is motivated because there are 20 million more men than women. So there, there's a practical gaping need that um, has driven and fueled uh, the buying and selling of girl brides from other countries. In, in the rural areas, because, uh, you know, all the young women in the countryside, they want to migrate to the cities and, and make more money. They don't want to marry a farmer. And so there are, you know, so many, um, you know, tens of thousands, if not more of these older farmers, you know, who aren't eligible, um, you know, they, they want to get married, but they're so poor. 
And so, you know, they end up buying these women for like, uh, you know, 200 US dollars. And I've heard a really um, tragic story many times that sometimes these, these older men will resell the women, you know, they'll get tired of, of the bride that they bought. And they'll sell her to another guy. And so one woman said to me that she was sold like four or five times. Mm -hmm. She was North Korean. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. And then another teenage girl um, that I interviewed, this is one of the brighter stories that I I wanted to um, highlight because it it gives you hope and it's it's a joyful story. And Hope is so important. Um, otherwise, the, the book would be a very depressing thing to read. <laughs> and uh, so this young young girl, she was 14 when she was uh, tricked and deceived by her friend's auntie, you know, from someone she didn't really know, but she was in the network. And uh, this woman starved her for a few weeks in an apartment until she was ready to do whatever she was commanded to do. And, um, and it's just, it's unheard of, you know, that she would be starved and then beaten by the very man who bought her, who we suspect was in his late sixties or seventies. Um, she, she didn't want to say exactly how old he was and he chained her like a dog. He chained her like a dog and unchained her whenever he wanted to use her. And in recent days, um, there, there was an article that came out about a woman who was chained up and uh, she gave birth to like eight, eight or nine children. I don't know if you, you've read about that, but that was in the countryside of China. So it's, it's real. It's, you know, this, this stuff does happen. And you talked about the, the traffickers being, it being greed and love of money, but sometimes there are other options when you're uneducated, you don't really have job. I'm mean, not, not to excuse, but to, explain wh- where the thought process is. So can you talk a little bit about um, like t- job disparity and just lack of education and, you know, just the mindset of how someone could really get into selling humans? Yeah, that's, that's a big question. I, so anecdotally, you know, of the people that I met and what they've told me, um, it's, it seems to be about who, you know, right. And, uh, so Guo, Guo, the, the trafficker, the former trafficker who became re- rehabilitated thanks to the door of hope. And he was studying to be a driver. Um, I mean, he himself and even his cousin. So it was like a family affair because I think his other cousin was like the big boss over a thousand girls in the Huaydu, like the highway area, um, which is frightening because if he's at this major highway artery that goes in every direction in, in China, it, it suggests that it's, it's a very sophisticated um, transnational operation, right? Because these, you know, they're catering to truck drivers and whoever else is, is driving through. So, what Guo told me was his cousin recruited him into it because he didn't really have any prospects at all. And, um, and he said that, yeah, there was no way he could get a decent job, um, you know, that would pay more than, you know, h- how much was it? You know, 300 renminbi, that's like 40 US dollars. Um, yeah. So he, he really, had uh, zero prospects of a decent paying job because he had, I think, a junior high education and then he dropped out. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I think it's it, the mindset would be, well, if if I'm not making big money, you know, selling women or, you know, or, or exploiting people, then I'm going to be, you know, they're going to be living in poverty, Right. So I guess it's that's that's what incentivizes them. And um, and then also an, another factor is uh, some of these people who are either doing the buying or selling or were victimized, they are living on the old opium trading routes. Mm, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, that's very important that you right? highlighted that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So no, I I love your thinking, Tiffany, because 
it's, it's deep. Like you're thinking deep and big picture. And um, so generationally, there are issues and cycles, generational cycles that people can't get out of. And um, so some of the victims and even some of the traffickers, I asked them, were your, you know, your parents or your grandparents, were they opium users? And um, most of them said yes. You know, if they were in the, you know, the golden triangle region, right near the China border and, and Southeast Asia, and it encompasses Thailand and, and Myanmar and, you know, and, and that's the old drug trading routes. And so I think even organized crime folks or the mom and pop individual opportunists, um, they can see that, okay, you know, and my husband, Matt Friedman, uh, talks about this um, in, in some of his previous talks that if you tra- if you traffic drugs, you know a person can use it once. But if you if you traffic and buy and sell people, you can use that person and profit from them like over a thousand times, right, or more until they're spent. Until they're spent, and um, tragically, uh, if 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 these uh, victims of of modern slavery are no longer useful, uh, as was the case with the Japanese wartime sex slaves, then they're expendable. Like I remember reading accounts uh, in the UN Special Rapporteur report uh, at, at uh, that was uh, written by Gay McDougal, and there was another one by um, Kuama Swarmi, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, and they were saying that some of the the Asian victims of Japanese wartime military sex slavery were beheaded or they were killed or their uh, babies were dismembered, like they were disemboweled um, because they were no longer useful, you know, and that and that's that's a common thing. And it's the root of it is dehumanization, right? It's de- dehumanization. And I suppose when when one is very desperate, and, and doesn't want to be resigned to a life of desperate living and, and, and poverty, then I suppose they might be more willing to, to do, um, you know, criminal acts, right? You know, especially if the payoff is, is so uh, lucrative. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up because I don't think that people, especially in the West, really understand that level of just disparity and being dehumanized. And so I I think it's super, super important that people understand that it's not just this other group out there. Why should we care? This is exactly why the, the, we're all human. This is, this is our connection. This is why that this is such an important topic. Yeah. And also like, I'm glad you, you raised the West because in the West, in Canada, where I'm from, and in America, um, there are runaways, right? And, and there are uh, children who have been abused uh, by a family member, and they don't have a safe place to turn to, and they will end up on the streets, and and they are trafficked. And, and their traffickers are uh, like someone who's trading drugs and gets them addicted and, and, and then forces them to sell their body. And um, so they'll either die of HIV AIDS, like, you know, many of the, the sex slave victims um, in, here in Asia, or they'll, they'll die of, um, you know, of, of drug overdose, right? So it's, it's an epidemic. It's, it's definitely an epidemic and it's been happening under our noses. And, and there are, um, I mean, I'll never forget this, this video I watched. Uh, I think it was in, in, um, oh, I can't remember when, but it, it was just a striking video of a normal suburban girl. You know, she, she had auburn hair, just a pretty, pretty young, young girl with like, green eyes and it it showed her descent into drug addiction and and which included selling her body right and um and so she was severely exploited and she died and and you know no one expected that a girl like her would ever end up 
in the streets of the downtown east side, the, the worst postal code for drug addiction in North America, so in Vancouver. Um, so it's, yeah, these are, these are precious lives. Like each life is so precious. And, uh, and the role of the family, I mean, I, I can't overstate it enough. The one's family is, is so important. You know, whether, it, whether you're a victim or a trafficker, I mean, it's, I think the family, the family life um, shapes the direction of, of a person's life. Absolutely. And even um, I think that people also think, okay, well, we just need to get everybody out of this and they're going to be safe. And, you know, with the work that I've done, one of the big issues is, okay, they get out, these girls and women get out, but we're still not changing the cultural issues. We're still not changing um, the gender discrimination. We're still not changing all of these other issues that brought the and the poverty and all of these other issues that brought these girls and women into this so they end up getting re-trafficked and exactly. that's and if people understood that if people could just understand like this is this is a cycle it's not just a linear process it's a cycle yeah no i i um really appreciate this insight and so that was my um my call to action that we, we need to recognize that, um, you know, Japanese wartime military sex slavery of 200 to 400,000 girls and women as young as 11 and 12 from women from all over the Asia Pacific, including Dutch women who are, you know, some of them were blonde hair, blue eyed. And people get shocked when they find that out because they were prisoners of war in Indonesia This is when Dutch uh, colonized Indonesia. And, um, and what I saw in, and heard from the survivors of Japanese wartime sex slavery, that's when I made the connection when I was seeing and, and talking with victims of modern day sex slavery. And I, I realized, wow, you know, this Japanese military sex slavery never went away, um, except, you know, it's, it's not government implemented and sanctioned, you know, in, in, in Asia. And, um, but the root, one of the roots the key root of what needs to be addressed is trauma healing, trauma healing, the girls, the women, the men too. And my heart goes out to the men as well. They don't get enough attention. I, I find in, in certain countries, but they need trauma healing because when they're healed of their horrific trauma, then they won't go from one, one terrible frying pan to another. That's why the women get re-trafficked because they're not healed and, and they, they, you know, so they end up being lured again or deceived again. Like the, the girl who was trained like a dog and sold as a bride to that elderly farmer, she got pregnant and ran away and ended up um, being forced into prostitution because there was someone waiting for her at the bus stop. She got on a bus to run away. And, and that reminds me of all the pimps and the bad people who wait at the bus stops in North America and Europe, you know, wait, looking to lure vulnerable girls who are running away from a bad home situation. And uh, so I, I really hope more people will, will recognize the importance of trauma healing, the importance of providing jobs as well, because um, I've heard of girls who were um, doing the job rehab program after they were, you know, so so-called rescued from the brothel, and then when they realized that, you know, making jewelry or doing something else was only going to give them like a fraction of what they they could earn, you know, selling their bodies, they made a choice. Some of them. Not, not all, just a very small fraction. They, they just, yeah, they, they didn't want to live in poverty, right? Um, that, and they're in the minority. I think, I think most women just really um, despise the, the exploitation and the pain and the abuse that, that goes along with that world. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I really hope that, you know, more professionals, more, more people will will, you know, step up, 
donate their time, their talents, their money and, and do something. But it, it, I don't feel like there's a lot of, um, what's the word, regional leadership in, in this area of sex trafficking. I, I think people or NGOs are working in silos mostly. And, um, and I, I don't believe the governments can do it on their own. I don't believe NGOs can do it on their own. I don't believe, um, you know, it, the schools or academics, everyone has to come together. You know, I, if, if there is such an opportunity and, and that's, that's why I've, I've been very passionate about trying to communicate with more family offices of, of philanthropists to try to get them on board and to raise awareness to these people who can drop, you know, a million US or whatever it is and, and get some kind of strategic initiative going. And, um, and so I, yeah, I truly hope that it could be cross sectors, cross um, you know, d- different like students, NGOs, governments, the UN, you know, everyone coming together. I mean, that's, I think that's what's needed because we, we just haven't seen the NGOs solve the problem yet, right? Not, not on their own. Although my husband, he, he works with corporations and banks uh, through the Mekong Club, and they've been doing phenomenal work at a fraction of, of the, the funds. Um, and they've been able to help a lot of people um, at a fraction of, of the cost. And, and that's through inspiring and guiding the, the corporate world to, to use their influence at their fingertips to help those who are voiceless and marginalized. I, and I, I'm so glad to hear that he's able to really leverage those resources because there are a lot of small nonprofits that that see the need and want to help, but there's lack of funding. There's a lack of organization. It's it's these bleeding heart organizations that want to do so much that see the problem, but there's just it can be a mess, and and that just becomes super super problematic. But I want to go back to the trauma healing for a second. So yeah. How does one go about healing and forgiving and having compassion for oneself and others? And of course, I'm thinking about, you know, when we're talking about anyone who's had sexual trauma, sex trafficking, but I also recognize that you interviewed these repentant Japanese soldiers. So I'm also curious on your thoughts of healing for even former military because of the absolute brutalness of war that I don't think that people like the average person really understands what war means. I mean, other than the nationalist propaganda that I'm not going to get on that soapbox, but like former military have seen, heard and done things. So how do you navigate this darkness and even the generational racial hatred that's been a byproduct? Well, yeah, no, that's such a deep, deep question. And I love it um, because it's, it's one of the, um, the themes close to my heart and, mm-hmm. and that is of uh, forgiveness and that is releasing the, the generational racial hatred um, that I've had, you know, as a Korean, I was born in Korea, raised in Canada. Um, I had a best friend who was Japanese Canadian. My favorite teacher in, in junior high was, was a Japanese Canadian guy who was interned actually during World War II. So his, his family experienced severe injustice. They had their property confiscated and they were forced into a stall, like a horse feeding stall, you know, um, where their toilet was, um, you know, where the, the, the horses uh, drink water, you know, the, the, the trough. And, um, and I remember hearing his stories. And so, but when I, when I heard about um, Kim Hak Soon, the the Korean sex slavery military Japanese military sex slavery survivor, it triggered something like a generational racial hatred for the Japanese, and suddenly I just felt uncomfortable. And I had grown up hearing stories here and there from like the Korean elders of, of my church who talked about, and and the children talked about, oh yeah, you know the Japanese occupied they colonized Korea and they 
forbid us from speaking the Korean language and they forbid us from wearing Korean clothes and and they they forced us to worship the Shinto god and it was a brutal occupation there was there was a lot of persecution of um you know of Koreans and and um so i so what i was experiencing i think was a trauma that was passed down from my ancestors and a and a resentment and a racial hatred that was passed down and um so i was writing about this issue of of Japanese wartime sex slavery out of anger. And then um, in 2008, I I traveled to Hong Kong. I was living in in Beijing still. And um, and I and someone said, oh, yeah, there's this Japanese Christian group. They they want to you know, they want to say sorry for what happened to, you know, the, the comfort woman and the the rape of Nanking, like all these Japanese wartime atrocities before and during the war. And I thought, oh, well, I, I don't believe it's going to affect me, but I went anyways. And they ended up saying, sorry. And of course, their apology could never replace uh, a Japanese government sincere apology um, that satisfies the survivors of, of wartime um, atrocities. Uh, But they said sorry to the Chinese first, and then the Chinese wept so much. And I I thought, wow, this is really, you know, it made me uncomfortable. And then they turned to me. I thought, no way, I'm not going to react. And I hardened my heart. And but they ended up saying, and I didn't really feel Korean as well. You know, I, I didn't fully embrace my Korean side until several years ago. And um, so they turned to me and said, Sylvia, we, you know, we want to, we want to say sorry to you. We want to apologize to you on behalf of the Japanese people for what the Japanese did to the Koreans during the colonial period, like, you know, just brutally, um, you know, taking over the country and for, you know, raping and forcing Korean girls and women into the, you know, the the Japanese military sex slavery system known as comfort woman. And I just wept like a baby. And I was surprised by that, by my reaction. And I thought, Oh, wow. Like in my DNA, I'm Korean in my DNA, even though I tried to erase my Korean heritage by, you know, at that time when I was a kid, I asked my mom never to speak to me in Korean, never to call me by my Korean name. And anyway, so their apology just broke through something and I was able to kind of to really release to begin to release the generational racial hatred for the Japanese that I didn't really have until it was triggered in me and um, and then from that time I began to write about this issue with a view to fostering and encouraging uh, racial conciliation and forgiveness and healing because I felt that, wow, there's so much, there's so many wounds from this period of history, the the wounds of history. And, and, you know, I wanted to be a healing agent rather than just tell the history and make people even more angry. Right. So that, that was, that was a watershed moment for me. And, um, and then you asked, you know, how, how, how do you forgive? I'd say it's an act of your will. And uh, it's even if you don't feel like it, forgiving releases you from the prison. It's not about that other person anymore. It, we can never and we should never allow another person to have control over our emotions. And that's what ends up happening if we can't forgive someone who has deeply hurt us then that person still has power over us, right? And um, so it's an act of the will, firstly, and then the rest follows. But that's, that's the first step, I'd say, in anyone's healing journey, you know, whether it's, it's sex abuse or whether it's, you know, division with a friend or, or estrangement from parents or other family members, um, yeah, I, I think it's it's such a a releasing thing. It's such a powerful thing to be able to um, free yourself from resentment and the prison of unforgiveness. 
What about forgiving yourself for things that you have seen and done? How do you navigate that? Uh, absolutely. Same thing. Same thing. So if it, it's no use if you could forgive everyone else except for yourself. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly where I was. Yes. That's where I was going. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And, but, but it's funny. We humans can compartmentalize. And um, so, I mean, that's not everybody's issue, but for someone who has a struggle with something that they can't forgive themselves for, and, you know, for children of divorce, it's, and, and I'm a, I'm a child of divorce. Um, they often blame themselves for, for the parents splitting up. Right. Yes. So, so there's some, you know, kind of weird or, or, or just distorted thinking that, that could happen when you're a child and you don't have the emotional maturity to process something or to handle like a crisis. Um, but yeah, I loved what you said. It's, it's, it's the self-forgiveness and forgiveness. I mean, that's, that's all part of the package. I, I totally agree with you. And we talked about, you know, taking action and, you know, how companies and, um, you know, nonprofits, and we touched a little bit on that, but I, I kind of want to um, go a little bit further because you described yourself as highly sensitive. I mean, specifically as it related to your childhood and dealing with the turmoil of your Asian identity, but I'm wondering if you can describe how you were able to navigate being in the trenches, seeing and hearing stories of brutal abuse and how you navigated vicarious trauma, especially as being someone who was highly sensitive. And I'm thinking of that because of people who want to do something, but are, you know what I mean? Like there's that, I, I, I can't deal with this. And I recognize that you even had to distance yourself um, when you were doing the wartime slavery work for a few years, but how, do you, how did you navigate it when you were in it? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I I couldn't do it full full on. And uh, I am not one who is made to be a frontline worker. (laughs) I think think I'm just too, yeah, I think I'm too sensitive for that Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of other people's suffering. Um, But I, I mean, I've had to develop a very tough skin. You know, as a journalist, you have to be, you have to be. So I guess that was my protective layer. Um, but there were times when in the beginning, when I, I didn't have that and I didn't want to have that, right. That, that uh, barrier to protect myself, that self-protective shield, because I wanted to really understand. And um, of course I would never do that again, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. but that I'm so appreciative of that time because it, it, really meant like full immersion at times into feeling what, what another person would feel. And, um, and as, as a journalist, as a writer, what I wanted was, um, you know, the, there's this saying that goes, no, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. So I wanted to feel, and I wanted to be able to communicate the power of what I experienced and bore witness to. So sometimes that meant paying the price where when I was nearly killed in China by the gangsters and the mama sons, um, I, I didn't realize that was post, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, when I came home and I like every creak in the floor, I like literally like woke up because I was worried, right? Right, right. Thought, oh my gosh, right. you know, and, and that lasted for like two months. That lasted for two months. And interestingly, the NGO, the frontline person at the door of hope should have told me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she should have warned me. She should have yeah. warned me and, and said, this is what could happen. I, I'm kind of shocked looking back that there was no such like guidance from her. And, um, and she had even wanted me to go into this, um, was videoing, right? Wasn't it the recording? Yeah. Yeah. This, this gym or it's like this huge hall and where, um, she wanted to expose it. So she was, she wanted to send me in there where they turn off the lights and the music and anybody could do anything to the other person. So it's like full on molestation party. Right. 
And she was trying to convince me. And I'm thinking when she was trying to do that, I'm thinking, what are you on? Like, what drug are you on? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, why would I put myself in danger? I mean, that's it's so, so dangerous. So anyways, in hindsight, I realized I wasn't in the best pair of hands, the safest pair of hands at that time, you know, when, when we were, all, we were confronted and um, when I was, was uh, when it was suggested that I walk through that brothel alleyway, looking like a tour, pretending I'm a tourist mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and filming. And, um, but I, I have no regrets. Like even, even though that was a really awful experience of PTSD, I, I was really thankful for, you know, seeing the, the vicious dogs and having the experience of being yelled at because it, it gave me an identification like nothing else, like nothing else. And I want to be able to communicate that, you know, whether it's through, you know, podcast interviews like this or, or talks that I give um, or when I speak with, you know, family offices or whoever it may be, I, I want to convey that. So sometimes our worst experiences become um, our most valuable ones. You know, where we've learned the most from them. So that, that's how I see it. And um, in hindsight, and if I have any advice to give to highly sensitive people, I would say um, maybe steer yourself away from frontline work. Or if you're going to do it, do it like, one week at a time, um, I stayed at a, um, uh, what do you call it, safe home or a, a rescue home. And I was with only one survivor at that time who was a single mom. And yet by the end of that time, I felt so depressed. <laughs> yeah. I was definitely not prepared when I went, because I mean, when you're doing the research, like you, you forget that you're able to walk away or you're able to have distractions. But when you are face to face with a survivor and like, it is, oh, like it, it's being in that environment, like it's a totally, totally different world. So it is no. And I, you know, I'm grateful that you can empathize and, but it, it, there was like, um, and perhaps it was because she wasn't fully healed, but I could feel her pain. You know, I could feel her pain. And then I could feel her despair over her um, single mother status. And, um, you know, a lot of women in China, a lot of young women are pressured to get married um, before the age of 30 or before the age of 40, uh, if they're professionals. And, um, and I, and they have this, uh, longing that seems a little bit more extreme than the women in North America or in the West. And, uh, I've heard someone say that the reason for that is because, um, uh, women in Asia were not considered a full human being until you were married. And then you were given a name, your husband's name. So before a girl is married, you're not, you know, you're, you're, you're just a, an expendable entity, not, not even like a human to have a name for yourself. So that, that on top, you know, on top of her, um, her pain, I can just feel this, her, her dire longing to get married. And then suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I, I want to be married because I was divorced at that time. I I just felt just this swirl of, of emotions that, wow, I was, I was not prepared for. So I guess the other piece of advice would be, um, yeah, just talk with the frontline workers about the potential for PTSD for post-traumatic stress disorder and mechanisms like good tools for you to protect yourself from it and if you do get it get help like go go see someone and i i had the the good fortune of being able to see someone about it but it was it was much later had i had i had the ability to see someone and recognize that i should have seen someone earlier i i would have done that but um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right, mm-hmm. Tiffany? Absolutely, absolutely. But there's so much support that you can do that doesn't 
involve being on the front lines. And I'm, I'm glad that you really talked about that. And if, if you could maybe just highlight again, all the work that can be done by everyone, because this is, it, you know, it takes a village and it's a global village. Yeah. yeah. No, I love, I love what you're doing. I, I don't, I don't think I've met anyone who's tackling humanitarian work and um, the fight against slavery in this way. And it's so important because um, especially for people who want to go overseas. Um, so as for what, what you can do to help fight um, sex slavery or modern slavery, it's, um, you know, for, for nonprofits, they, they need help on every front. They need marketing support. They need website support. They need fundraising help. And on the marketing side, that includes like photography that's creative because um, some NGOs or most NGOs don't want to take uh, photos of the survivors, you know, for uh, ethical reasons. And um, and so I'd say fundraising is is a pretty important role uh, because without it, you know, the the smaller NGOs um, can't keep going. And so they need management help. So any kind of business background um, is really ideal. Or if you're a social worker and want to do more frontline, um, having a social work or counseling background or even specializing in trauma healing can go a long way. You know, whether it's um, dealing with modern slavery survivors or disaster um, disaster area survivors, uh, they struggle with trauma, you know, as, as do um, people on the, on, on the front lines of war, you know, in, in war torn areas. Um, wow. Yeah. Trauma healing is so needed or play therapy, art therapy. Um, so whatever your talent is, I am a hundred million percent sure that there will be a role for you in the front lines in Asia or Africa or South America, wherever you want to go. If you have talents and um, you, you can Google it, Google, you know, whatever your talent is, if it's photography, Google like humanitarian photographer, or if it's, you want to do something in sex slavery with makeup, even I remember uh, one of the NGOs I was writing about they brought in a professional makeup artist to teach the girls, like how do you beautify yourself? And and uh, and I think they they went into like the whole concept of like self esteem and inner beauty, which are so crucial. So if more high schools and elementary schools had um, teaching on self esteem and uh, you know it, being a, like a strong, confident person, then perhaps the vulnerability would, would decrease. Absolutely. Sylvia, thank you so much for all the work that you are doing in the world. I mean, all of the awareness and um, shedding light on these stories and amplifying the voice of the oppressed in, in this field. I thank you just so much for the work that you're doing in this world and, and for being a guest on today. I, I really appreciate it. No, thank you. I really enjoyed this talk. It, it just flew by so quickly. And uh, I really love what you're doing. It's, it's um, vital that, that we can inspire and motivate uh, the masses to, to do something, to do the work of social justice and to help the most marginalized, uh, which is really my passion to help those who are forgotten. And um, so thank you for your heart of compassion and love. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.